Joining me now is our special guest for this hour, Michael Novogratz. He's the principal and director of fund manager Fortress Investment Group. Uh, Fortress manages a total of $44 billion, including over $4 billion of liquid hedge funds that is under Mike's watch. Mike, great to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, so you just heard President Obama say, look, deflation is the big threat here in the U.S. That's why we had QE2. However, the last time we talked, you were saying that inflation was basically the straw that broke the camel's back in the credit bubble, right? And here we are again with commodity prices surging and everyone's talking about inflation. So, you know, commodity inflation is an interesting thing because it can either be a price shock and really act as a tax to consumers. Uh, in an economy like ours, where we have lots of extra excess capacity, high unemployment, uh, higher food prices, higher energy prices, really are a tax to consumers. And acts as we a, haven't seen that yet, though. We haven't seen the higher food prices. No, we haven't yet. But the, the commodity prices are telling you they're coming. Uh, and so what, two things happen. Margins get squeezed on the companies that actually sell food. Mm -hmm. uh, and in time, food prices go up. It's, it's a much bigger deal for the emerging markets where their economies are much tighter. Right, in and so China. In China, in Brazil, uh, in India, high food prices, high uh, energy prices create domestic unrest and will translate into inflation. And so, interestingly enough, the, the, the commodity boom uh, has a more detrimental effect on the uh, emerging markets than it does on the developing markets. But are you surprised that China hasn't acted quickly enough or quicker to stem inflation? You know, China kind of wants to have their cake and eat it too in a lot of ways. The, the, the currency peg and the, and the real recalcitrance to, to let the currency appreciate uh, creates an environment where they need to buy dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Asia alone will take in close to $600 billion of reserves this year. It is a staggeringly large number. That translates into liquidity and creates bubbles. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to try to raise interest rates at the same time not let their currency appreciate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. And so in the long run, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. Right. It doesn't make sense. So then what do you foresee happening? Well, uh, you know, we just went through G20. Right. Uh, there was lots of talk about trying to, uh, to get some targets on current accounts. Uh, Which didn't happen. Didn't happen. Uh, the best thing we can say about G20 is that the leaders recognize the world is relatively fragile and there are big imbalances. And let's not try to do something really stupid. Um, but nothing really changed a lot. Well, and in fact, we talked about this earlier, um, which is that the president um, perhaps may or may not have had an easier time at G20 if Bernanke hadn't moved on QE2. You know, the Chinese have done a masterful job of, of, of playing the cards on this one. I mean, it, 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 they've turned a, a problem of them having uh, a peg currency or a, 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 an overinflated currency uh, into our problem and saying, geez, it's the U.S., look what they're trying to do. It's worked internationally, it's actually worked domestically. And we've got Sarah Palin out there agreeing. Um, but to be fair, though, I mean, we have also benefited, though, from a lower Chinese currency over the last 10 or 20 years, have we not? I well, mean, that's been part of our growth as well. You know, part of our economy has benefited from it. Uh, in in the, the high end of our economy, anything intellectual capital, our, our actual capital, connectivity capital, the, the high end has benefited as wage, uh, wage prices have gone down. The low end of our economy, our, our labor, has certainly not benefited. Mm -hmm. uh, now they've been able to buy cheaper TVs and that's kind of kept them pacified. Uh, it's kept the American consumer pacified, Amer American let's consumer put it that pacified. way. Yeah. But the, if you look at manufacturing job loss in the U.S., uh, there's probably 7 million manufacturing jobs lost since 1997-98. If you think about China, devalued their currency 50% in 1994. But you're not going to correct that by raising the value of the yuan, right? Come on. There are two things you think you need to do. I think at one point the currency needs to appreciate some. The other side of it is we need to open markets. You know, we've been talking free trade and free trade, and right. yet all around the world, the emerging market answer has been, you got to give us time to develop our own domestic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So if it's consumer in Brazil or if it's financial services in China, American companies are, are, are held back from participating. Michael, right before the break, of course, we were talking about the outcomes of the G20. Um, a lot of disappointment, I think, surrounding the results of this. We didn't get much of an agreement with any teeth. So here on out, where do we go from here? Well, the one thing the G20 did do, which is, is new, uh, the IMF had done it previously, is in a lot of ways condone emerging market economies using capital controls. I think it's actually a dangerous precedent, but uh, Why they, is that? Well, they call them prudent macroeconomic policy. Um, during times like uh, this last month, there was $190 billion of reserve accumulation alone in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are probably times when smoothing that flow of capital makes some sense. 
Unfortunately, in a pl place like Korea, you know, the Korean won this year is appreciated all of one half a percent. Mm. And so there's a lot of chest pounding about, oh my goodness, the, 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 the U.S. Is, is weakening the dollar. Uh, the so you Kore think there's an overreaction among some of the emerging economies? Well, I think they're, they're, they're using this frenzy to, to justify wanting to have mercantilist policies, wanting to keep their currencies undervalued. If you look at the Korean won versus the Japanese yen over the last three or four years, uh, export volumes in both countries kind of track the same line. Mm -hmm. And when the yen appreciated as much as it has in the won depreciated, Korean exports boom versus the Japanese economy. Mm. And so it's unfair to say, well, currencies don't matter. They matter a lot. Right. Uh, if I was Japan, I'd be furious at the Koreans. Mm. Um, and so Korea is probably... And so therefore you understand why the Japanese are intervening then? I certainly do. Yeah. If, if, you, you look like the fool, the fool on the sidelines when all your competitors are intervening and keeping their currencies weak and you're not. And so it all goes back to stemming from China because the RMB is broadly pegged or has moved so little. It's moved 3% this year, which is something. Uh, but China's got a roaring economy. Uh, they've got an inflation problem showing up. Uh, and quite frankly, if the natural movement of that economy, you wouldn't have accumulated $2.8 trillion of reserves. And then, and yet you've got the U.S. where critics, even within the United States, such as the former Fed president, uh, or former Fed chairman, uh, Alan Greenspan, saying, look, we're purposely devaluing our dollar. Well, you've got to be careful on the words. We're setting uh, monetary policy to try to adhere to a dual mandate, one of growth and, 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 and inflation. We've got dif disinflationary and deflationary forces in this big deleveraging that are going to hit our economy for the next few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had anemic growth. Uh, and even though now things look like they're picking up a little bit, uh, we need a lot of growth for a long time to chew through this giant uh, surplus of labor that we've, we've, we've sidelined. But then, Mike, I mean, don't you think that that's protectionism on our own end then? No, I think it's macroeconomic policy that's, that is suited to your economy. Um, the dollar should weaken relative to the Asian currencies. Your current accounts, the, the, ten years ago when people talked about reserves, they used to talk about three months import cover for mm -hmm. reserves, mm -hmm. right? We now have like 36 months in places like China. Um, and so they're no longer reserves, right? This has been a strategic decision to keep weak currencies. Uh, and quite frankly, it's worked brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And from a Chinese perspective, and I don't, I don't uh, fault them for this, they have you know, 1.4 billion people. They still have 600 million right. people to, mo rural areas, to yes. move to, the, to, to get to the same kind of balance where we have. Uh, between rural and, and so and then urban. it sounds as if you think we should be tougher on China. We should be far tougher on okay, China. Okay, so what should we do on China? Well, I think it's two things. I think you got to be you, you know the, the, the last time China moved in a big way was when Sh you know Chuck Schumer uh, in 2005, and you know hate to give Chuck the credit, all the credit, <laughs> but there was a little bit of a good cop bad cop. It was cop. a loud voice though. Yes, there, Chuck was loud, and and the, and the Senate was loud, and, and and Hank Paulson played good cop, and, and that worked. It got China to to move and. You know, I think. So then, do you think this administration has been weak? Then I think this administration has not played their cards as well as they could have. Okay. Uh, and you know, b both getting the international community on their side. Listen, the Chinese are are in a very powerful position, and they're very smart. If you look what they're doing with Europe, right? And you think about uh, when the euro was at 118. What turned the euro in a lot of ways was China coming and saying, "Hey, we'll support the Spanish bond auction." Mm. Right. Preserving the status quo makes all the sense in the world for China. Okay. Uh, so, Mike, let me just jump off of what David Walker was saying, which is, you know, which you've said in some ways as well. You know, we've got this class warfare that's going on, not just here, but really around the world, right? And you may have seen that somewhat in the midterm elections. I'm not sure, but it means that we're not addressing the problems here in the U.S., though. Well, listen, one of the big problems, and I'm not sure it's anyone's fault, is that as an offshoot of globalization, uh, labor broadly speaking, has gone down in value relative to intellectual capital. And that gap between rich and poor is, is, is big, and, and, and it's big all over the world. And we have 43 million Americans on food stamps. Uh, that's a shocking number, right? It's one in seven and a half. Uh, and so something's not working. And I think people are angry. I think one of the reasons you're seeing the elections go from Republicans to Democrats to Republicans back and forth is quick. I remember that didn't used to happen. We had 46 right. years of a, of, a, of a Democratic House. Well, and, are you angry or are you scared right now? You know, listen, I'm in a privileged position of being one of those guys in the intellectual capital positions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so me and my cohorts have done very well through this whole thing. Uh, what I think needs to be given a lot of thought is what are the real solutions? Uh, and I think the political environment in D.C., which has been so caustic, hasn't really been helping. Uh, we're, we're too far to the left. We're too far to the right. 
Uh, and we really need to think about, you know, what do we need, need to do to change. So how does that affect how you're trading right now? Mm -hmm. Lots of people unemployed here right now. You said the inflation story hurts companies here and abroad. Does that mean your long commodities, short stocks? Some people have that view right now. So, you know, the great thing about being a macro trader is you can be a cocktail party conversationalist and, 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 and talk at 60,000 feet, try to understand <laughs> all the social dynamics. And what drives markets are often uh, shorter term dynamics. Uh, the big picture theme is that we have ran a huge credit bubble for a long period of time and it's going to take multiple years to delever. Uh, and it's, we're early in the deleveraging process. If you look at Japan, it's been 20 years and now they've finally delevered. Uh, I'm certainly hoping it's not going to be 20 years here, but it's going to take some time. Uh, I do think this tension and this political uncertainty is going to continue because I don't think there's an easy fix uh, for the 10% unemployment rate that we have. Um, so then what does that mean then? then? What works in this environment? What as works an as an investor? Yeah. Listen, I think you want to continue to play a deflationary theme and so when bond markets sell off, you want to buy them. Uh, that doesn't mean equity markets necessarily go down because you've got global growth and so the, the, the emerging market versus domestic trade is a big, big trend. So you want to play the deflationary theme, so you don't want to be in gold then. You know, gold is interesting because gold really has not been a, a, you know, I was kind of wrong early uh, thinking gold would be a deflationary trade and it, it, it has really been a, an alternative currency. And, you know, when it crossed a thousand, we kind of got the religion that yes, this is an alternative currency and it's, it's a worry about the debasement of fiat money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fiat money hasn't been around as long as people think. And uh, that nervousness in the world shows up in the gold price. Well, it's just 20, 30 years or something like yeah. that, right? I mean. Uh, and, and so there's not a lot of gold uh, out there. And until I think there's global economic stability or, or more so, uh, gold is going to still be under uh, demand pressure. What do you think about the dollar against the euro? We're starting to see people come back into the dollar now. Mm -hmm. So I was telling a, kind of a, a bigger picture secular story of this deleveraging. You're still going to have cyclical ups and downs in it. And you know, in the last two, you know, the claims reports and the jobs report, uh, we're starting to see some progress here in the U.S. And I think if we continue to see job growth, the, 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 the dollar will strengthen. It certainly will strengthen against its G10 counterparties. Partly because there was such an overwhelming belief that the dollar is going to weaken, right. that there will be some correction in it. So, now, it's a big question, are we going to see continued job growth? So does this tell you, though, then, that the Fed acted too quickly? No, I don't think so. The, the, that deleveraging impact of, I mean, we went to 370% of kind of leverage to GDP. No right. one had ever been that high. It will take us a while to get through that. That is disinflationary and deflationary. And the Fed's got a, a dual mandate. Uh, you know, if you look at the Fed's own forecasts, it's plus 3% growth for the next couple of years. And so you could scratch your head and say, well, my God, why are they doing QE2 if we're going to grow at 3%? Right. It's the inflation numbers that they're worrying about. And just, you know, I know, Mike, you don't want to talk about your own business, but just I do have to ask you one question, though. I mean, for Fortress, though, uh, you're putting a lot of money into Asia, right? I mean, you just opened up a hub in Singapore, right? Listen, when you look at the demographic shift in the world, uh, right now, India has 600 million people, two United States under the age of 25. Uh, if you look at the amount of 25 uh, to 35 year olds in 20 years time, it's just staggering mm -hmm. where that block goes. And so, uh, you know, it, it would be crazy to try to be a global financial services player and not to be involved in Asia. Right, not to be in Asia. Okay, Mike, thank you so much for spending the time here with us. Really appreciate it. That was Mike Novogratz, the principal and director at Fortress Investment Group.